shall the burial rite be read, the solemn song be sung. Requiem for the loveliest dead that ever died so young. The friends are waiting on her, and on her gourd he bear, and weep, O oh, to dishonor that beauty with a tear. They loved her for her wealth, they hated her for her pride, but she grew in feeble health, and they love her that she died. They tell me while I speak of her costly broidered pall, that my voice is growing weak, that I should not sing at all, or that my tune should be tuned to such solemn songs so mournfully, so mournfully, that the dead may feel no wrong. But she has gone above with young hope at her side, and I am drunk with love of the dead who is my bride. The dead, dead who lies, all perfumed there. With the death upon her eyes and the life upon her hair. So on the coffin, loud and long, I strike the murmur sent through the gray chamber to my song shall be the accompaniment. Thou diest in thy life's dew, but thou didst not die too fair. Thou didst not die too soon, nor in too calm an air. From all the friends on earth, thy lives and loves are written to join the untainted mirth that mourn thrones in heaven. Therefore, to thee this night I will no requiem raise, but waft thee on thy flight, the peon of old days. to astonish us, add to these her youth, her beauty, her innocence, and a character is composed which has not, and perhaps will not ever again be found in any theatre. I garnered high praise in my husband, who deserted us after my daughter was born, and died in obscurity, never seen or heard of again. The year after he left, I contracted the consumption. Dying and unable to perform, this advertisement was placed in a Richmond newspaper. To the humane part, on this night, Mrs. Cole, lingering on the bed of disease and surrounded by her children, asks your assistance, and asks it perhaps for the last time. For particulars, see the bills of the day. I died that same year. My obituary in the Richmond Inquirer read, the stage has been deprived of one of its chief ornaments, and to say the least of her, she was an interesting actress, and never failed to catch the applause and command the admiration of the beholder. The childhood's hour had not been, as others were. I had not seen, as the others saw, I could not bring. My passions from a common spring, from the same source I have not taken, for that my heart to joy at the same tone, and all I loved, I loved alone. Then in my childhood, in the dawn of a most stormy life, was born from every depth of good and ill, the mystery which binds me still, from the torrent or the fountain, from the red cliff of the mountain, from the sun that round me rolled in its autumn tint of gold, from the lightning in the skies and parsley flying by, from the thunder and the storm and the 
cloud that took the form when the rest of heaven was blue of a demon in my view. I was the middle child. I was born in Boston two years before my mother's death. I was adopted by Mr. John Allen, a Scotsman, and a prosperous merchant of Richmond, Virginia. At the age of five, he took me to spend five years in England, mainly a boarding school, in the rural country village of Stoke Newington. You might be familiar with it. My schoolmaster there, Mr. Joseph Clark, had this to say about me at the age of 12. As to Edgar's disposition, character as a boy, though playful as most boys, his general deportment different in some respects from others. He was remarkable for some respect, his that haughtiness strict, just and correct in his demeanour with his fellow playmates, which rendered him a favourite even with those upon his years. His natural and predominant passion seemed to me to be an enthusiastic ardour in everything he understood. Differences of opinion with his fellow students, he was very tenacious and would not yield till his judgment was convinced. His imaginative powers seemed to take precedent <coughs> of all his other faculties. We have proof of this in some of his juvenile compositions addressed to his young female friends. He had a sensitive and tender heart and would strain every nerve to oblige a friend. I grew up in the South. I would always have a certain way of speech. My voice was noted as low and melodic, and I would always be tinged with it. So next, I was pleasing to the eye of ladies, and would later on receive my proud military burial from my days in one of our country's finest academies. I did not bear a mustache until my mid-thirties. Age 15, I met uh, Mrs. Jane Stanner, the mother of a school friend. I loved her deeply, as if I was her adopted child and visited her own home often. Yet a year after I had met, she died insane at the age of 28. This affected me deeply. My childhood friends later wrote of my greatest fears at the time. The most horrible thing he could imagine. He disliked the dark and was rarely out at night. One occasion he said to me, I believe the demons will take advantage of the night to mislead the unwary. Although, you know, I don't believe in them. Our soul shall find itself alone amid dark thoughts of the grey tombstone, not one of all the crowd to pry into thine hour of secrecy. Be silent in their solitude, which is not loneliness for them, the spirits of the dead, who stood in life before thee, are again in death around thee, and their will shall overshadow thee. Be still. The stars, though clear, shall frown, and the night shall not look down from the high thrones in the heaven with light like hope to mortals given. But their red orbs without being to that weariness shall seem as a burning and a fever which will cling to thee forever. Now our thoughts thou shalt not banish, now our visions there <laughs> to vanish. From thy spirit shall they pass, no more like dewdrops from the grass. <coughs> Breeze, the breath of God is still, amidst upon the hill. Shadowy, shadowy, yet unbroken, is a symbol in the token. How it hangs upon the trees, the mystery of mysteries. At the age of 17, 
I entered the University of Charlottesville, a non-sectarian establishment founded by Thomas Jefferson. But whilst in my first year I gained the highest marks for my knowledge of both ancient and modern languages, when I and second year students were examined by two former presidents of America, Madison and Monroe. Did I return to my stepfather's business in Virginia at the end of the same year I had arrived? Two and a half thousand dollars in debt through gambling and drinking. Fill the mingled cream with amber. I will drain that glass again. Most hilarious visions clamber through the chambers of my brain. Quench the sports, queer as fancy, come to life and fade away. What care I how time advances? I am drinking ale today. <laughs> <clears throat> Some would say that it was here I developed my taste for liquor. It was while enlisted at the age of 18 in our armies, in our country's army, that I published my first poetical works, Tamerlane and other poets. They were a failure. But I had enlisted. In spring of youth, it was my lot to haunt to the wide world a spot for which I could not love the less. So lovely was the emptiness of a wild lake with black rock bound and the tall pines that towered around. But when the night had thrown her pall upon that spot as upon all, and the mystic wind went by, murmuring in melody, there. Ah, then I would awake to the terror of the lone lake. But that terror was no fright, but a tremulous delight, a feeling not the jewel man could teach or bribe me to define, nor love, although the love of I. <clears throat> Death was in that poisonous well, and in its gulf a fitting grave. For him who thence could solace bring to his lone imagining, whose solitary soul could make an Eden of the Eden way. I rose to the rank of sergeant. The highest and non-commissioned officer could achieve, and went on to spend a year in the West Point military camp. Comrades there assisted me to publish a second collection of poems. Again, they were not well received. What is wrong with this world? My work was not what my sponsors had anticipated in its dark moods and melancholy dispositions. I arranged my own court martial in order to leave and embarked on a lifetime career as a journalist, <coughs> writer, magazine writer, poet, and storyteller. I was, I was noted for my genius at code and cipher deduction, which was reflected in the intricacy and sophistication of my detective stories. It was also this year that I met my then nine-year-old cousin, Virginia Clem, and her mother Maria. We started to live together in Baltimore and were to be inseparable for the rest of our lives. Now, without me. Because I feel that, in the heavens above, the angels whispering to one another can find no, can find among their burning terms of love, none so devotional as that, but as mother. Therefore, by that dear name, I long have called you. You were more than mother unto me, and fill my heart of hearts where death installed you, and setting my Virginia's spirit free, my mother. My own mother, who died early, was but the mother of myself, and you a mother to the one I love so dearly, and thus a dearer than the mother I knew. By that infinity to which my wife was dearer to my soul, and its soul life.
after his poor elder brother, who had lived with us, had died of consumption. He left for Baltimore, but would return to us four years later. She was the ever vigilant guardian of the home, watching it against the silent but continuous sap of necessity that appeared every day to be approaching closer and closer. We were poor, very poor. She was the sole messenger, keeping everything clean, the soul, doing the errands, making pilgrimages between myself and my publishers, frequently bringing back such chilling responses as the article not accepted, or the check to be given until such and such a day, not before. Often too late for the necessities of the household. She was also the messenger to the market, from it bringing back not only the delicacies of the season, but only such commodities as were called for by the dark exigencies of hunger. Thank you very much.